Hey everybody, Jason here. Welcome to part two of my conversation with the Dr. Dennis De Pasqual. For people who didn't tune in to part one, shame on you, first of all. Once you're done with this episode, please go back and check out part one. Don't stop now. Just let's get through the good stuff and then you can go back. But if you don't know his background, he is a professor at the University of Florida's Warrington College of Business sales program. He focuses on sales management. He's a public speaker. He's working on podcasts, courses, all kinds of great stuff. Fascinating thing about his background is he was in business, not in sales, went into getting his PhD and then was asked to run a sales program, which then made him realize, wait, I guess I was doing sales. And then it led into this. So I think that's a perfect transition into this part. So part two here, the conversation is mostly focused on persuasion, which is the intentional focus on moving the right people forward in a sales conversation, in a sales process. How would you describe your persuasion process from previous career business side when you're moving people forward, especially as you dissected it afterwards and looked at what you did? Aristotle's logos. So it start there. I think that when we're talking B2B, and this is this has always been the case with me, you have to make sure that you are giving a logical, compelling reason to buy. So what that means is that you have to show ROI for what you're doing. I had a client back when I was doing advertising and PR strategy. And one of the things that he wanted to do is he just wanted to hire, it was a magazine and he wanted his magazine sales department to just be hot college chicks, quoting him on that one. And I'm like, why? People will just buy from them. And I'm like, first of all, wrong, because unless they're lesbians, I don't think you quite understand who the buyer is in this, this position. But even still, they have to justify their ad spend. They're spending a thousand to five thousand dollars on ad purchases with your magazine, but they're not seeing the results, they're gonna get in trouble. And so you have to make sure that you got that ROI. Now you do have to be likable. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be attractive in the way that he was going for, but you still have to be a likable individual. That's the pharmaceutical industry stereotype, if you will, mm -hmm. with the pharma sales, which also means you have to be kept up and attractive, not bald with a beard. All of these things have a subconscious way of persuading. So for this, I think the first thing that I have to bring up is Cialdini's Weapons Tools of Influence. And if your audience hasn't checked out his book called Influence, I would highly recommend it. I don't know if you can put like an image of the book on the side, but basically this book talks about what creates subconscious reasons to do something, to buy, to come over to your side. And so these things such as reciprocity, when we give something to someone, they're hardwired to give something back to us. Um, creating liking by under by highlighting the similar factors between us appeals to authority all of these things are pieces that can persuade but they can also manipulate and of course getting into that first conversation we had about authenticity the idea is here is you just want to make sure that you are persuading someone to do something that's good for them that they're going to not regret in any way shape or form not manipulating to do something against their will which is, of course, where that stereotype from Wolf of Wall Street, from Matilda, uh, <laughs> that's where it comes from, right? They're just there trying to, to trick people to make that purchase. The, the other thing I just thought about is one of the National Lampoons where he ends up getting the wrong car. And in, that's unfortunate that pop culture has created that impression of salespeople who are not persuading, who are absolutely manipulating people. And, and so when someone does get properly persuaded, sometimes there's always that click in the back of their head to saying, oh, but you didn't want to do this originally. And I love that you brought up the sales model. Let's say pharma has, and you can see it if you look, but even that previous business you're referring to where they're really just going for getting people to buy now. And then it's, 
but are they going to stay a customer? Like you're saying, like if someone's in, investing $5,000 a month in some marketing spend, they need an ROI. There's only so much that charisma and charm and looks is going to get you as, as far as a long-term client goes. You might make yeah. the sale today. That salesperson is gone. And then the business now has what? And then the client now has what? And problems. And that's what you've done. You've created more problems and haven't solved any. So in terms of the model that I use, there's no one particular, so I guess there's layers of what you mean by when you say what model, there are some people that say, do you use the spin model? There's some people that say challenger model, Miller Hyman, all of those models that are out there. Primarily we focus on me specifically, not just need satisfaction, but something called insight selling, which gets into challenger sale is basically helping the customer see problems that they may not even have that you can help solve with your products and services, which requires again, having a genuine conversation, having absolute trust so that they're willing to share details about their business that could be borderline proprietary or covered by an NDA or something along those lines. And. If you've got that authenticity, then you can start hearing about their problems. And the idea is that not just selling this thing, it's saying, you said you have problem X. I can demonstrate that this solution will solve problem X. It will do Y, which will solve problem X. Do you see how that's good? Here's what you're spending because of problem X. Here's the savings that you're going to have when you implement our solution, ROI of 50%, ROI of 500%, whatever it happens to be. So give me an example, because on the surface, I'm familiar with Challenger and Spin and, and all of those, uh, but you said something about help them realize there's a, about a problem that they didn't know they had, which mm -hmm. starts to sound more Sandler Payne submarine. Find a healthy person, make them realize they're sick, make them beg you for a solution and then solve it where it's okay. Did that actually help them or did you just make them feel bad? But what um, you're saying, obviously you want to help them in some way, but like give an example of what that would look like or a product or a solution where they don't know that they have a problem, but they actually have a problem. So I'll use two examples and they're my role plays. So if there's a student who has not had me yet, they're about to get, get the answers to the test, so to speak. In the first role play, they have to sell me a book and it's actually one of three book, or one of four books that they have to sell me gap selling a challenger sale, let's get real or let's not play or spin selling. And when they sit down with me and they say, Hey, I have a textbook I'd like to sell you. That's their first approach, which of course they're a textbook salesperson. That's when I'm like, okay, I'm happy with my textbook. Oh, tell me about the problems you're having with your textbook. I'm like, I don't have any problems with your textbook. And what they have to do is they have to really talk about what I'm doing in my business, in my position as a professor and what are my goals. And then it tunes them into talking about what could be holding me back from achieving my goal. So again, for those of you that didn't watch the first one, I'm doing exactly what Jason just said. He said, shame on you, go watch it. You'll see that it, it's all about understanding those problems and what's holding people back from those problems. And so if they don't say you're trying to, the shortcut there is that I'm trying to build confidence in my students. And if they don't ask that, then they don't get a chance to say, what, how are you? building confidence in your students. And of course, list all the projects that I'm doing and everything else. And like, how is that going for them? How do they like it? And then of course I can say, well, they have these frustrations with it. And then they can say, what's the frustration? Oh, they don't know sales fast enough. And how are you teaching them sales? I'm using a textbook and eventually we get to it. But if they flat out come to me and say, how's your textbook? I say, it's fine. In the second role play that we're doing, it's a very similar situation. In fact, I send them into a hostile situation. It's about handling objections primarily, but it's also there's insight sales. And so the person doesn't realize that their sales are depressed in this role play, in this scenario, because their coffee is crap. It's a convenience store. And so it's up to the salesperson to say, your coffee isn't working very well for you, but you've shown that people coming for the coffee also come in for other items. But if people aren't coming in for as much coffee, do you see how that might be why? And here's the objective rating of your coffee. And here's the objective rating of our coffee and why you need to buy our coffee system for you. And of course, then you demonstrate all the savings and the person says, oh, wow, I didn't realize that this little problem was actually a bigger problem. And so 
you'll often hear building on the pain. It's a bit of a gap selling approach, but what it really comes down to is sometimes people are stuck in their own ways and it's up to you to say, you could be doing this better and my product can help you get there better than the competitors as well. Switching it to the buyer side now, going to the other part, what do you think the biggest challenges are with persuading people to take the best action to get them to a better place? Like I said in the other episode, there's three sales going on there. You could have the best product or service, but if your company has a bad reputation, that's not going to go very far. Your company have, could have a great reputation. You could have a great product or service, but so will the competitors and eventually they're going to copy it anyway. So what does it really come down to? It comes down to you as the salesperson. What is your value add? And I don't think that people realize that they can be the value add. And it just, again, getting back to the first topic requires that authenticity and genuine interest. That's a big piece of any selling model. If you don't have that genuine interest in bettering your customer's life, their professional life, obviously, or their home life, if you have a B2C, then it's going to be an uphill battle for you. So from that buyer side, why don't they buy? Like, what do you think gets in the way of them wanting to buy, especially again, when it's something where this could help you, but yeah. they don't say yes. Showing the value. Any objection usually is either a logistic objection where you might not have prospected properly. So I don't want to spend that money because I can't afford it. It's not in the budget. There is literally nothing I can do to write a check out without bouncing that check to write it out. It's a bad product design. When I say bad product design, that means the price is just not matched up properly. And that's not usually the salesperson's problem. That's your marketing people that put the product together or the service together's problem. Forgetting those side, it's what is the entire value of the exchange? Because again, competitors are going to come in very similar and hope, hoping that you don't have a purchasing department that's going to hijack your purchase. Oftentimes the value of the relationship that you have with that salesperson is going to be a piece of it because let's talk about risk. For example, let's say you're making a $500,000 or a million dollar purchase, or it's a small purchase that could have the implication of $500,000 or a million dollars. What happens when something goes wrong? Because something can always go wrong. And I don't think anyone is ever snowed to the idea that every product is always going to work 100% of the time, 100% to its capabilities. So when that doesn't happen and I reach out to the salesperson, what's going to happen? So when I said in the previous episode about customers not wanting complication, that's part of it, that they don't want their life to be complicated. They don't want their jobs to be at risk. And if you make a bad purchase in some cases, your job could be on the line and that could be a, a reason for a big hesitation. So what is behind a lot of those objections? How are you really listening to those objections to make sure you understand it? I have copied the vector marketing objection handling model in my class. I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for talking about this. I don't think it's proprietary and I've seen it modeled with different letters in different areas, but it, are you listening and not just listening to what they say, obviously you don't want to interrupt them, but are you looking for body language that says that there's some sort of hesitation going on? Are you acknowledging that they have some sort of objection and not blowing right over it? But most importantly, are you talking to them about the objection? I do this with my students in the very first role play with one of the books that they, if they recommend it, I say, oh, that book's too old. And immediately what they do with most salespeople will do is they'll hook right into a response. Oh, it's old, but it's research and the research is still used. And my response is, I don't care. It's still old. And if they explore it, they find out that my concern is actually the student perception of the age because students don't often care about that. Again, it's all somewhat fictionalized in how I deliver right. it. But the idea there is if you didn't explore it, you wouldn't understand why I have a problem with the age of this particular book spin selling because it goes back to the eighties to which a good salesperson would say, oh, I understand you're worried about the student perception. So if I give you something to include with the book, 
that shows that it's still current, that the students will respond to, that would be good. And that's the type of response that shows you've been truly listening. And again, it gets into having a genuine business conversation where they're comfortable talking about this stuff to you so that they bring up all of the reasons for the objection, not just the objection itself. Same thing with the price objection. Price objection could be anything. And mm -hmm. if you don't talk to them about it, you're not going to understand where that objection comes from. Because if they're objecting, that means that they think it's going to cause a problem. Remember, they don't want things to be complicated. They don't want problems. And I, I love that. I know one thing about you is that you're not a, here is the one sales process, one size fits all, like here's, mm -hmm. here's how to sell, right? Like here's the thing. So in the mode where maybe you're taking different bits and what you said with the insight selling mode, which is the framework, how do you teach that to people? How are you teaching the students all of those different things without it being like one model, right? Mm -hmm. One playbook. How do you approach that? And so I'm going to respond to that, but I want to underscore this for anyone who's a sales manager who's listening. This is going to be extremely important. I can tell them, but that's not going to be good enough. I do tell them, this is what insight sales looks like. This is the challenger sale. You've read the challenger book, but they have to see it. And that's where the role play, not just see it, but experience it. And that's where the role play comes. So it's not just telling them, it's showing them. And of course, allowing them to practice that so that they can understand and how they can ask these questions and probe a little bit deeper. And even after I do that, it takes them a little while to warm up to it, depending on the type of student that you happen to be dealing with. Students who are willing to practice it with the teaching assistants a little bit more often are going to get it much quicker. And that's going to be the same thing with your sales forces or you yourself. You've got to practice it with more seasoned salespeople or with seasoned sales trainers who are going to be able to do those role plays and let the struggling or just the salesperson that wants to do a little bit better really have a good punching bag to play against. And so what's the directive then that you're giving the students because it's a fluid conversation, right? It's mm -hmm. dealing with another human, which you can't script and you can't map out step by step. Yeah. For my teaching assistants, it's giving them varied scripts. So there is a script to it, but how many different scripts can you get them to practice it? But it's getting them to trust. I don't want to say the process, but the process. It's getting them to trust that they just have to have genuine conversations. And I try to get them to see it not just in the sales vein. I get it. I try to talk about it in terms of how you have conversations with your friends, how you have conversations with people that you're interviewing with, really just understanding the problem. One of the things we don't do in life is we don't actively listen very well to other people. We only listen to respond. We don't listen to understand. And teaching that general foundation of active listening, of genuine desire to have empathy, and don't confuse empathy with compassion, but they are related, but to desire to really understand where someone's coming from and really understand their business. It requires me as an instructor to really train students to be curious or find ways of helping them see the value of being curious to really be able to have those detailed conversations. So think about it for yourself. Whenever you are having a problem, oftentimes you just want to talk about that problem. You don't necessarily want the solutions thrown at you right away. And having a salesperson who guides that conversation where you talk about your problems and <laughs> professional therapist, if you will, to be able to discover that. And I feel like I may have gotten a little off track from what you were looking for, but. You know. No, I think you, it's somewhat of a bias on my side because I agree with you, but it's about the genuine conversations. Like you said, it's about listening, not just to respond, but to actually understand being curious, being empathetic. And I love what you said too. It's not just in sales, but in their conversations in their life. And then what I have said forever to salespeople and teams is that when you do it right, and right is a judgment, but I don't care. So I'm going to say it. When you do it right, 
the sales conversations, B2C, B2B, it doesn't matter because like we've talked about it, it's H to H, right? It's human to human. But a mm. sales conversation when done right should feel like you are the therapist in a therapy conversation. And it should be, they should share things with you that shock you because you're surprised they were that open and honest. And then it should feel somewhat draining at the end, exciting, but draining. Like that was a lot, like emotionally. That's mm. when I feel like you're doing those conversations correctly. Yeah, absolutely. It's just role playing with the students, giving them that safe space, saying, hey, here's what I want you to do. Just keep practicing, keep being curious, keep being empathetic. Fight the instinct to just want to talk about yourself or your product or your stuff. Yeah, and one thing, this doesn't come from me. This comes from my colleague, Steve Tufts. One of his mantras is the person who's asking the questions is the one who's in control of the conversation. By asking the questions and having that guided element of it and putting the effort in i've had students who just go into the role plays for the grade and then they leave and then and they don't get the grades that they were hoping for and i've had students who even with one extra practice right before a role play they do so much better and it just shows that practicing having those conversations a lot of its nerves so as seasoned individuals you and i can go out there and don't have the same nerves that some of the newer salespeople might have in some of their initial conversations. And so the practice helps ease those nerves, especially in the early stages of the career. But even the later stages of the career, it still matters. And it's like anything. It's like what you said in part one, which was confidence, right? That's your goal is to build confidence. And then, like you said, in the later part of the career, it's also about sticking to what works instead of just going off the reservation and thinking like, oh, I know everything, which Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's what causes sales lumps is when people just start winging it or think they know enough that they're just dangerous. The world changes, people's preference changes, strategies, all kinds of things change. And if you just keep doing the same thing, you just think you know it all, then you're not open yeah. to it. And I think that's a great plus for us to finish off our conversation on persuasion, sales process. Dr. D, I know people want to connect with you. They can do it on LinkedIn. Dr. Dennis D, the website, drdennisd.com. If anyone's noticing a theme here, when in doubt, search for Dr. Dennis D. Also, you have the YouTube channel. All the links will be in the show notes. Did I catch everything? Did I catch all the Dr. D places? Absolutely. I am working on a podcast. <laughs> Don't have a title for that yet, but I'm sure Dr. Dennis D will be in there somehow. It better be the Dr. Dennis D show, or this is going to throw off all of our our call to actions here. Dr. D, I appreciate you being on the show, talking about this. And I'll say it again, because I, I love saying it at the final part was, thank you for all the stuff that you're doing with the students and helping shift their thoughts on sales and then giving them the tools and the confidence to go out there in business, but also in their lives and having these genuine conversations. So I, as a, another human in the world, I appreciate that from my own self-centered side. So thank you for being here. Great being here. Thank you very much for having me, Jason. And we will see all of you on the third part. You better join us there. If you didn't make sure to check out part one, even like he referenced, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of this journey. Hopefully this helps fill you with inspiration, some ideas, some ways to have those genuine conversations shift the way that sales is done, your own personal conversations go. Like when you have empathy, empathy and curiosity and your goal is genuine conversations based on that, it will shock all your family and friends because they're not used to it either because it's not something that's common out in the world. You want to throw people off, actually ask them questions, actually listen and actually care instead of just trying to talk about yourself all the time and it works amazingly well in sales uh, as we're both laughing at that because it's so true and it's so impactful but it's so fundamental thank you for being here and thank you for helping fill the world with authentic persuaders